UFC 161 ties a record that no one wants, Dana White needs his bad boys to play nice in the media, and sparks fly on the ultimate fighter between Ronda Rousey and Mr. and Mrs. Misha Tate. All that and more coming up, this is MMA on Draft. This is First Run TV, you're watching MMA on Draft from Arena Sports Bar in Simi Valley, California. I'm Rich Slayton, joined by Joe Cervellan, Donna Gonzalez, and Gary T. Let's get into it. UFC 161 tied a record for the most decisions in one single event. Some people like it, some people don't, but most importantly, there were a lot of weird fights. Let's start first with my good friend Joseph Cervellan. Joe, what do you think about UFC 161? What stood out to you? What stood out? Uh, well, there was a quick, exciting knockout of Pat Berry by uh, Sean Jordan that uh, was disappointing to me because uh, I like Pat Berry and he's been knocked out a few times recently. He's fighting a lot of uh, big, powerful, quick guys. Uh, he's fighting a 250-pound man that could backflip very w and actually land it. So a that, former uh, college football champion with LSU in 2006. Right, that as well. So the combination of that, uh, that you know, I would say that was probably the most exciting quick fight of the night. One of the, the only, only ones that didn't go to decision. The, the yeah. only quick fight. Of the night. I don't know if it was yeah. necessarily <laughs> the only exciting fight, and that was definitely the only quick fight of the night. Right. Okay, so one winner of the night, Sean Jordan. Donna, any losers on the night? You know, I I got to give Big Country the lose, the the big loser. It, we could call it karma. He did turn down two huge contracts and then maybe had a little bit of a fumble in something he said in the media. But Big Country took a big beating and it was, for his fans, painful to watch. But man, I mean, the man could, t you got to give it to him. The man could take a shot right. and oh, he, he did take hit. a hell of a beating, but Big Country got beat. But did he Bad. lose or did oh, the other... He got Beat. Or, or the other gentleman win. I still can't pronounce his name. Was it Stoy Stoyichi? Stephen Miocic. St I still can't pronounce his name, but <laughs> that guy. I gotta, say, I, I gotta say, I gotta say, he was great. Game plan. So, move to the right. Stay in big country's right hand. Box his face in. Yeah. Box his face in. Conditioning was there. I, I wouldn't say that country lost. That, I, the guy impressed me. No, he did. He he fought his fight. He did a great job. But and any given night with big country in the cage. That that could have been a different fight. That was not Big Country's night, and he took one of the worst beatings we've ever seen him take in the cage. I think he, I think he just boxed him. The guy out boxed him. Big Country started waiting to smoke him, but then one big white overhand to knock the guy out. It never happened. Un he he, he outbreathed him as well. He, yeah, he got gassed, undoubtedly. <laughs> but I don't know if, you know, I don't know if that means that he, he was definitely the better fighter in the cage that night. But like I said, put Big Country in the cage any other night, it might have been a different fight. Well, Big Country's not known for all of his preparation. You know, this is a guy who's a very talented fighter, very tough dude. But you know, there's there might be a little bit of uh, an oversized BJ Penn attitude. Should he go down in weight class? Oh yes, of course he should. But he's never going to. It's gonna be difficult too. He's, he's a big boy. He hasn't belly. recently looked better than his last couple of fights. Right. Like last, the last three times Big Country has gotten in the cage, you know, he's looking looking a little trim. So, could he go down in weight class? Absolutely. Should he go down in weight class? We'd all love to see it because he'd be excellent at light heavyweight. I don't think it changes the fact that there were just a couple other things going on that night and it fed into him being the biggest loser, in my opinion. Now, it wasn't all just Roy Nelson and Steve Amochik. It wasn't all just Sean Jordan and Pat Berry. There was also a headlining fight between Rashad Evans and Dan Henderson. Gary, you had some pretty strong opinions about that fight. Well, actually, Henderson uh, kind of fought like Nelson did the fight before that. You know, Nelson, uh, Henderson is, is a sort of, you know, he's got the mean right hand, and people know that he's so, it's almost like a one-sided fighter. Kind of comes in waiting to do that overhead shot, and people know that. And Rashad is just much bouncier, much quicker, left to right. He was able to, you know, out, out bounce uh, Henderson. And I think that's how he won. I gave two, round two and three to Evans. So, I mean, the, the, the fight ended the way it should have ended. No, has, no surprises there. Has Rashad kicked the Black Zillions' curse? I mean, I know the Black Zillions have won since right. beginning, but do you think Rashad's over that hump? I think Rashad's always. 
going to come to the cage and fight his fight. Here's my problem, or the problem with the Henderson-Rashad matchup. It's too perfect of a matchup. You've got two great wrestlers who are very competent strikers, and they completely nullified each other's game. Had they gone to the ground and maybe tested each other on the ground where they neither of them uh, are known to work, that would have been an interesting, fun fight to watch. But, you know, you match up two exact same copies, and you're going to get a fight that completely just wipes each other out. And that's I think that's what they did. I don't think either one of them shined in that fight because the other one nullified everything the, the, each other could do. So with this win, what's next for Rashad? What, what should he do? I think Rashad is back on track to uh, get a belt. I think they what? match him up with, I don't know, Glover Teixeira. That would be a really exciting I'd fight. I'd see that fight. That'd be a really exciting fight. Um, should he go to 185 maybe? He's called no, out I think he needs to stay exactly where he is. I think Rashad is really exciting at light heavyweight and he's great for that pool of fighters. Alright, lightning round on this one. Let's play school teacher. Give it a grade A through F. UFC 161. Joe, an A, B, C, D, or F? Uh, it was a, a B. A B? A solid B? A so I like UFC, so I'm not going to give it a B minus. Okay, I'll give a, it a solid B. B. Donna Gonzalez. I give it a solid B, and can I just throw it out there that I thought the ladies put on a hell that of a, a fight. fight. That was a great fight. Absolutely. Yes. Wonderful fight. I had no problem with it. Going to decision, we'd all love to see knockouts. We'd all love to see people go to sleep or get their arms broken. But solid fighting is what we want to watch, and it. I think everybody put on a solid fight that night. I wasn't sure if I'm more impressed with Davis of her fighting ability or Rosie Sexton, who took a meet me beating. Absolutely. They were triangles. They were rear nakeds. Yep. There were punches at some point. Dean Herb in the second round was like, Are you gonna? You better start fighting, you know? And the fight would have been finished if Davis wouldn't pump him a couple extra hard punches. Absolutely. So, Gary, what's your grade for the event? <sighs> oh, man. You know, my favorite fight was, was, was the Kraus fight with the... Uh, with the Canadian guy. Oh, Stout. 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 Yeah. I like that was that was my favorite fight, which was the undercard. So when my favorite fight is on Sometimes the undercard. The have the best fight. Yeah. I, I give it a C. You give it a C. A yeah. C? I give it a C. Oh, Maybe right, C plus. So a B minus a average C from plus. UFC 161. <laughs> Next up, a lot of controversy lately coming through Dana White's inbox. Fighters taking to Twitter, taking to the airwaves, and saying some things that maybe they shouldn't say. Donna, you had a lot to say about this. I do. I'm not even going to go the route of let's be good human beings and not say horrible things to other human beings. Let's go from this point of view. The UFC, MMA, but specifically the UFC, is a multi-million dollar corporation. You as a fighter, a professional athlete, are now a product. You don't get to run around just saying whatever the hell comes out of your mouth and think it's cool. Nobody gets to say, oh, boys will be boys and meatheads will be meatheads and it's all good. No. You are a professional fighter and you need to act accordingly and I think them Putting in place the code of conduct was exactly what needed to happen. And when you go outside of that code of conduct, you need to be you need to be suspended and you need to be docked a whole bunch of money because you are a product <laughs> that is being presented to the American public as a huge you're a commodity. So act like it. I mean, given that these guys are fighters though, they're not should there be a different standard for fighters versus NBA players? Should that code of no, conduct No, these be? are professional fighters. If we want MMA to be taken as seriously as um, the NBA or the NFL or any of the mainstream sports, then we need to start acting accordingly. And the fighters need to be held to those standards. Joe, do you agree? Uh, w about which part? Well, pick one first. Do the fighters need to be held to the same standards as NBA stars. I, I don't I don't know if I can answer that question. Uh, I think they have a code of conduct that they now have to sign and follow. So it's just the gray area where are they still allowed to call each other bitch or pussy or can they Busting not say? Busting balls is totally different than using really inflammatory words that you know will incite a whole community. Well, let's get down to brass tacks about it. You have Roy Nelson uh, calling Daniel Cormier and Uncle Tom. You have Nick Diaz and then Nick Diaz's manager using Nate. a pretty... Uh, Nate Diaz. Nate. Using a pretty inflammatory word for homosexuals. Right. I guess the inflammatory the word. The word. The, the one. Right. There's ways to bust balls and trash talk your opponent without having to go to those specific words. Or right. how about inciting certain things about their skin color or... I mean, the religion. Just, there's ways to trash talk without going there. 
Even with a code of conduct, I think for these type of guys, it's going to be difficult. It's going to take some time for them to really get to the level of the NBA, the NFL, Absolutely, where they're trained. These guys are brawlers. You know, these are the, these are the guys. They're not brawlers. They are professional athletes. I, I, I got it. They, they become professional athletes. But all these guys, you know, if you step on their foot in a bar, they're swinging that away. That is they're, absolutely they're, untrue. Oh, come on. That is absolutely untrue. Most of the guys in MMA right now have been bred to be fighters since they were 12 years old. They do jujitsu. They do wrestling. They do stand-up. These are not guys guys that they pulled off the street. This isn't Kimbo slide that they pulled off the street. They're like, oh, let's make you a fighter. It's not 1993. Right. I got a These are guys who have been bred to were... professional fighters by this point. Yes, it's not at the not point yet. of the NFL, but it's on their way, and they are smart enough to know that this is not how you behave in public. There is that whole idea of don't dress for the job you have, dress for the job you want. Absolutely. Well, how about if they start insulting each other's girlfriends or wives instead of homophobic or transphobic? I mean, is that should be... These are all things that pure professional athletes do not do. Why do you need to go after somebody's wife when if, if I want to trash talk you and we have a bout, how about I just talk about how you're not good and you can't beat me? Why do I need to attack your wife? Now what about the culture of emasculation among men in particular in competition? The, the, the main, the majority of smack talk, fine. but so where does that line begin? You know, Joe's making a great point about calling someone a, a bitch or a pussy. Sure. That those are words that you could say, well, those words are used in a dominating way to oppress women. And so those, and those words make femininity something negative. I would negative. imagine that if there was a man that was going to fight a woman, calling her a pussy might not be the best way to go. But if it's a man fighting another man, there are just maybe some words, some red button words that we shouldn't use. And... How about throwing up the finger? I mean, is, would that... So Fit in your level of uh, conduct? I don't think there's anything wrong with trash talking. However, you're effing the crowd. The you're throwing up your finger to the crowd, to the oh, media. Yeah. Children but are watching. Should that right. be in the conduct? No, they, they should be in the, uh, the code of conduct. You can't do that. I mean, look what happened anytime the UFC's on um, with NBC or. On Fox? Yep. Yeah. Dude, Nate Diaz, behave! Behave like the, the professional athlete you are. This is a multi million <laughs> dollar fun. sport. It's fun. It's fun to watch, so. Joe likes that. Joe loves Everyone when he likes goes. a good wardrobe malfunction. No one no one was sure. really sad that we got to see a little bit extra of Janet Jackson. Sure. Uh, but maybe her parents. I mean, you know what I mean? But if if I own the UFC and I know that I'm going to have to pay a huge fee because you want to act like an idiot, now I've got a problem because you are my product. We're not talking about out there in the world how everybody's allowed to act however they want to because they're allowed to do that. This is a business, so act accordingly. Okay, so with a word like... The, what's currently considered the new F word for homosexuals. Sure. But the word like that one, is the problem with that word, is the problem more for the UFC the word itself or is it the public reaction to the word? Are we asking to hold fighters to a standard that's an, that's an ethical standard or to a professional standard? Or is, are they the same thing? I think it's the exact same thing. I think that there are just places that you go, places that you don't go as a professional, regardless of what you get to think inside of your own brain. If you worked for some other corporation as a professional, I don't know, computer person, you don't get to go on Twitter and just type anything that just comes into your head. <laughs> you have to restrain yourself. That Peter, people don't throw elbows at the office. Correct, but this is their business. This is a business. Ask any fighter trying to get a contract with the UFC right now, and they will tell you how much of a business this is. For a long time, the UFC has been considered the only game in town for combat sports. But as we've seen lately, a lot of other promotions and a lot of other types of combat sports are coming up. We have the rise of Metamorris most recently, and of course, Glory's Kickboxing League. Gary, what do you think is the, the, the place for these sort of single combat sports in, in the world of combat? Because you have to remember that, you know, these single sport combat, that's how MMA started. Right. Remember, remember back in the first UFC 3-4, it was Kung Fu fighter versus the Taekwondo fighter, kickboxer versus Capoeira. MMA came from single sport uh, contact fighting, you know, and, and it is a total, there's total room for, for it. I enjoy watching K1. I enjoy watching fighters do kickboxing and then thinking to myself, how would this fighter last the MMA? Could he knock out the top guy in UFC or Bellator? Or if the top guy in UFC Bellator came into K1 and just had K1 rules, would he get smoked? I of think so. that goes for, uh, <laughs> that goes for any kind of uh, <laughs> Fight, uh, fighting, you know, I kind of, I, I so I enjoy it. I just total room for it, and they complement each other. That's what I think. I think they absolutely complement each other. I think that the more, I, I think they feed each other, and how they are going to grow, because the more people, the more, the more the average Joe watches the UFC, the more they're going to want to understand the intricacies of each of the specialties. And so when you 
have something like Metamorris, you're like, oh, the ground game is really interesting. I want to watch something like that, where all these guys are doing is fighting on the ground, and these are the top guys in the sport, then you become not just an MMA fan, but you can become a jiu-jitsu fan. And vice versa. I think they absolutely feed each other. Well, did Meta Morris make a lot of jiu-jitsu fans with their last event? Yeah, actually, I think they did. I think there were some people, but I think his his point, you know, they took a UF, uh, Brandon Schaub, a UFC fighter, and put him up against a really high-level BJJ guy, and it wasn't a good fight because Brandon was playing his game and uh, Cyborg was playing was was trying to play his game. But same time, you couldn't put. Cyborg in the cage with Shab. However, the rest of the fights I think were really exciting. Did you watch Cron Gracie choke out the Korean zombie? That was some good stuff. Uh, the ladies brought it as they always do, and I think they're watching the intricacies of a game like BJJ and learning like just everything about it makes you a better MMA fan and a more informed MMA fan, which helps the sport. Joe, what about the World Series of Fighting and these other sort of mid-market MMA promotions? Is there room for them as well? I think there's always good. It's always good to have competition. It's places for you. Uh, well, UFC is at the top right now in MMA, at least, and it's places where they can pull uh, new talent or bring talent back. And it's also places to, to put guys like John Fitch, I guess. Uh, Ooh, you mean at the whoa. end of Josh Berkman's arms? Yeah. That might have been the most badass submission I've ever or seen. Or the worst refing. The war the worst ref. Maybe both at the same time. <laughs> um, that was almost you know, a little scary. Yeah, it awesome was... to watch somebody get put to sleep. Right. But to have Mazzagatti just, hey, what's going on there? I mean, dude. Berkman that let is go your of job. him. Yeah. <laughs> Your your fighter should not end the fight when the other when he feels the other guy goes body's limp. You should end the fight for him. That's your job. Right. Well, I don't think that uh, that Fitch had a chance to tap in that one. I didn't see a tap coming. Yeah, from no, Fitch. no, I didn't see it coming at all. And and you know, that's nobody's perfect, but <laughs> that was just one okay. of those moments that Burfa got up and he's like, boom. What? But is that is that more that Josh Berkman's choke was badass? Because we, we we look at Mazagati in the cage, we're like, well, clearly let's blame Steve Mazagati because right. he's often blameworthy. But was that one Josh Berkman just squeezed the hell out of John Fitch? Well, I, think I think it was a surprise. Rocked he rocked he, he rocked, rocked him. He he corked him up as Absolutely. he took him down, and I think he kind of DDT'd him like you know. Uh, uh, Jake the Snake Roberts style. I think his head hit the ground after. So just that trifecta. Yeah. I think Mazagati was, I'm not saying he couldn't have refed it better, but Fitch is, has been so durable and tough that I think he was just kind of surprised that Fitch was out. Yeah, I, I think, think that was part of I it. I don't think Fitch had a chance to recover yeah. from from the knockdown, and so it was the perfect storm of right. everything that exactly. happened to put him to sleep. What's next for Fitch, guys? I don't think he's done in the World Series of Fighting. One one loss doesn't equal an end of a career. I think that he still has plenty of fight left in him. For sure, you but he, he's been UFC. put out cold a couple. I don't think he's going back to the UFC. Fitch has been put out cold a couple times now. So my only concern is if you know, kind of, if the jaw that he had before is gone. Is is his button broke, or is this going to happen to him? Every time now that he gets rocked real hard or caught in a good submission. I think that's up to him because, as we know, MMA fighters are very emotional creatures. So, Fitch's losses getting into his head could absolutely affect his performances, or it can go the opposite way. And you never know. You right. know what I mean? Well, it we're could talking two different things here. There's the confidence issue and, absolutely. you know, all that and how you're going to prepare. But also there's the medical issue of there's only so many times you can get rocked and come back from the dead. Right, but he didn't get knocked out. He got put to sleep. That was a choke. But he did also get, did he get knocked out he twice before dazed. that? No. Yes, but he, that fight wasn't a knockout. He got so, dazed but and But he's never been put out like that. But it, I, as far choked, as I know... But that's not but the same thing as getting knocked out. But Johnny Hendricks knocked him out and slid him halfway across the ring. So it's just, I don't know if that's just coincidence that that happened. Sure. And that's what I'm getting at is, did the Johnny Hendricks brutal knockout of Fitch kind of affect why he just... Does Hendricks get the assist for Josh Burke? Right, exactly. Exactly. Who knows? On some level. Yeah. You know, not to take anything away from Berkman, it was a brutal choke and he might have finished him anyway, but he put him out cold, right. like dead. Well, and I've that's never a matter of sinking a choke in correctly. That has nothing to do with the ability of the other fighter, because if you get that choke in correctly, you're going to sleep within seconds. It's true. 
The question is, did the punch set up the... Would Absolutely. the punch have set the choke the up as up much choke. had okay, he yes. not been on the, the receiving end of Johnny Hendricks' huge fist? But then there's the argument, anybody can get caught at any time. That's very did John, true. Did John Fitch just get caught in that moment and then, and then Berkman was able to capitalize on him being dazed for the choke? Yeah. Or... John Fitch could absolutely be in a bad mental place, and and there goes his career. It could be either one, but we'd have to see him in a couple more fights before we can answer that. And just by watching or saying, oh, he lost, is not a good way to answer that. Anyone can get caught, and that raises questions for many fighters. Most recently, Antonio Big Nog Noguera, Antonio Big Nog Noguera, Minotauro got caught in a very nice arm bar from Jiu Jitsu Specialist Fabricio Verdum, raising questions for some people as what's next for Big Nog and is this reaching the twilight of his career? Me personally, I think that it's not an age issue for, for Noguera. Oh. I think it's an issue of difference in competition. If you look at his, his myriad of wins, his nearly 30 plus wins when he was before the UFC, right. his opponents had a, had a win percentage of maybe about 57%. Whereas the four losses between Frank Mir, Cain uh, Velasquez, and Fabricio Verdum, they have a win percentage of 77%. Right. These are top tier guys. Absolutely. I think it's more of a competition yeah, level it's, it's not the same losing to those three as opposed to losing to people that we don't know their names at this point. The Frank Mir surprised me twice. Okay, the first one, he had a staph infection, there was a couple excuses, I bought it. But the second time when he submitted him, uh, I, I was shocked. Remember, Nogueira a couple of years ago, this is the guy, never been submitted. All of a sudden, is getting submitted. With Frank Mir, who's a great if a fighter, especially on the ground, but I, I just don't think that should have happened in that, that kind of way. In the Verdum fight. You're talking about the arm break? The arm break, yeah. And in the Verdum fight, Verdum's a great fighter. I, 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 I don't know. There's arguments that Verdum has a better jiu-jitsu pedigree than Nog. It's not, I wouldn't sure. say for sure, but there's, there's an argument to be made for that. It depends on who you talk to in BJJ, you know what for I mean? Sure. That's the whole, you know, I'm just family fight. I'm just surprised when one of the best uh, jiu-jitsu fighters uh, in mixed martial arts gets submitted. You know, that's... You yeah, it's but by thing, a very high-level black belt, they didn't get submitted by blue belts who just started rolling. It's not like you Brendan know, Shaw ago, choked right. out. He got submitted by incredible. But when, but, but, but when Frank Mir did it, I was like, no way, man. Frank no Mir way. Frank not only is, it a, is a black belt, but he's also a very competent MMA fighter. So there, you know what I mean? Frank's a high level black belt. He's not just some guy who went to the, you know, McDojo around right. the corner and got a black belt. Like, like, we're I not talking about dudes that, that just got in the cage. That. These are veterans who know how to work the cage and know how to work their game inside of the cage. Yes. Well, it's not the same as losing to Brendan Schaub, who I'm a fan of, but it's not the same. Not Especially like getting submitted by Brendan Schaub. Right. You get hit, that's gonna hurt. Right. How, about, how about fighters, guys, that you're watching a fight, you know, they're, you know, like Henderson's 42 years old. He's in great shape. He can still fight for the best of them. He, can he get the title? I don't think so. Can he be, is he the stepping stone? Is he the gatekeeper? Henderson you're talking about? Yeah. I'm mean, giving as an example. Two BJ Penders coming guys. back. Do you think he still has the ability to win the belt right From now? From Jones? From Jones. If he caught Jones, there's some, I can't, Henderson is, He's sort of one-dimensional on paper, but when you actually watch him perform, he's one of those old-school guys that is still really good today. He's he hasn't evolved, but he's he's I, I don't even know how to say it. Of course, it. he's he, evolved. He, he, he's evolved, but he's not like one of these guys that's been doing MMA from 12. You know, sure. he was you know he's an old-school guy. Sure. Not meant. There's only a few guys that have, were able to come out of you know real old school. Uh, but he's able to use just that one punch, or he actually had an uppercut also. He's able to basically use two attacks and still, you know, fight a top guy like Rashad. But should a fighter, That's just fascinating to but me. But should a fighter who's at, the, at that age, who knows, probably he won't win the title. Should he stick around just because... I think he should go to middleweight. Absolutely. I think he has no business being in light heavyweight, in really? my opinion. Why? Uh, because people forget that in the first round of his fight with Anderson Silva, he had Anderson mounted in that fight. He was really in a good position to win that fight, right. and just the fact that Anderson was able to claw his way back and then choke him out in the end. Okay. I think that Dan Henderson is way more competitive size-wise with the guys at, at middleweight. But that's an argument for a whole lot of them. True. You know what I mean? And there, there's also the argument that a whole bunch of guys at 185 could very easily fight at light heavyweight. But Dan Henderson's not, Dan Henderson's not a tall light heavyweight. That's he's, correct. He's, That's he's a true. reasonably well-sized he, middleweight. He, he would do great at middleweight. I think, we don't Inter, I think Dan fight. Anderson knocks out Chris Weidman if they fight. 
Oh, that's interesting. I'm a flyweight guy. Let's go to flyweight or bantamweight. How about Anderson loses 100 Send pounds? Send him to 135? Yeah, yeah, why not? Set him Man. down, give him a mighty mouse. But he's, he's not getting like knocked out or anything. If he was getting laid out cold, yeah, he's not getting his there's no kids. reason for him to retire if he he's wants to keep fighting. No, he's absolutely competitive where he is right now. If he wants to go down to middleweight, that would be exciting. But we're not talking about a guy that we're like, oh, this is so horrible, we got to do something. Dan Henderson is still competitive exactly right. where he is. How about health issues? Health issues. When you get to that age of 40 years old, even if you can still fight like a did, you know, health-wise. Again, he's, he's, he's not getting beat up. Right. Chuck Liddell, it was time for him to probably retire because he right. was getting just knocked out way too much. It was really sad to see him go because he was one of the faces of the sport. But that's not happening in Henderson yet. Kotor uh, retired, I believe, at 44 or 45, and that was after Machida karate karate kitted his front tooth out. Well, how about BJ Penn? Can we come back? I mean, after the, the layoff, I after think getting BJ beat. Come back. BJ at 55. BJ at 55. just can't BJ fight. BJ needs to come back at 55. BJ can't absolutely. fight big guys anymore. You know, five years Agreed. ago, he was able to fight uh, Machida at what, light heavyweight? I think. Uh, he can't, he can't do that anymore. No, he needs to be he, at 55. Yeah. That's where he's competitive. Yeah. A few years ago, he can do that. Like, I, it's, I don't know if it's an ego thing or what. He thinks he can just go to any weight class, not, you know, train, you know, as much as these other guys. If he's at 55, I think, yeah, he can become champ again. I think ego absolutely. Ego or, you know, I don't want to cut. What's that? Ego or I don't want to cut. Yeah, that too, for sure. <laughs> I, he like, he does, yeah. I think he likes to eat. I mean, it's a, that's, that's the real fight is, you know, diet. Who knows what the future holds for the old guard in the UFC, but there's plenty of opportunities abound for the new guard. In particular, our two coaches for the Ultimate Fighter this season, Rowdy Ronda Rousey and Misha Tate. So far, a lot of news coming from inside the house. Dana White saying this is some of the craziest stuff he's ever seen. Most of it he thinks won't even make television. A lot of people wondering Hi. what's going on inside that house. And Gary, you have some pretty big questions. I think it could be a rating spoil. Like, let, let, let me first ask you. When Rousey was supposed to fight Kat, which I was excited to, but now since this change-up, her and Misha fought already. She, she beat Misha. Right. Are we really excited to watch these two fighters go at it? Because part of the, the rivalry is exciting. The yeah, emotional. I think the rivalry is very exciting. You mean, you mean the, the cattiness right. in the house okay. is the exciting. Okay. Rivalry. I have a huge problem the 12 with episodes you using or whatever, that word. Episode. And here's why. When uh, Frank Mir and, no, Frank Shamrock and Ken, Sh was it Ken? Ken Shamrock and Frank Mir, did you call them caddy? When they were Hendo getting caddy. When Hendo and Bisbing were going at it in the house, were you like, oh, they're so catty. How come just because Rampage Bonda and Rashad and are so Misha, catty. They are. How come it's just because it's ladies, you use the Rashad word caddy. Rashad and Jones were getting catty. Fighters Rashad and John Jones. Who put on Jones. a hell of a fight and used the word caddy? Come on. Do you think the two female coaches will do a good job coaching? Will yes. it be about the coaching? Why wouldn't they be good coaches? Yeah, why? Just because they What is the reason they wouldn't? That... No, I want to hear it. Gary, why wouldn't they be? I'm thinking the UFC is going to promote everything about the, you know, the, 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 the bitchiness and the cat rather than the fighting. I think that's what it's going to turn out to be. It's not cattiness. They're two fighters with a it's rivalry. It's rivalry. It's emotional we conflict. We haven't seen it. Yeah. We don't know what the hell they're going to It's East Coast, it. West Coast. It's big and two Why is it cattiness just because they're women? Why specifically are you using the word catty? Because I can see it happening. Like, I'm not, I can see two no, females going at it. No, they're two fighters with beef. Yeah, not, this isn't a sorority house. They're two fighters wanna, with a beef. Uh, are you going to watch the season? Are you going to watch? Yeah. Of course I'm going to watch. Of course I'm going to watch. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not. I'm not. First of all, I always watch the Ultimate Fighter because I enjoy right. the show because yeah, the fights are awesome. DVR. And secondly, Ronda Rousey and Misha Tate, and the way I've been hearing about Ronda going after uh, after Mrs. after Mr. Tate, Brian Caraway, Brian, Brian Just Coast Caraway. I've been hearing so much stuff coming out. Yeah, that's that's the nickname. Sorry, Brian. We all agree that that was really bad coaching from the corner. I think it's hype. I think Dana's promoting it. In. Of course it's hype. Of that's what that's what the fight hype. game is. What is the fight game without hype? I don't know. I, I, you think he go, oh, no, it's cool. Everybody's getting along. Smooth sailing. You, you, you There's think, no drama. Do you think the male fighters are going to listen to them? Absolutely. Yeah. If they Not don't, they're stupid. Show, I'm sorry. But because it's I'm going to tell you. Okay, I have a story for you. I was at a fight party and there was a gentleman there who does not watch. He's not like us, he's not UFC fans on the regular. I said something about Ronda Rousey and instead of saying what, I'm a Gina fan, but instead of saying what most people would have said about Gina, oh is that the hot chick that fights, he said, is that the chick that ripped people's arms off? And I just had this moment of pride. I was like, yes, that is the chick that ripped people's arms off. And it was so cool that this person who was not an 
MMA fan knew that Ronda was not the hot chick, but she was the person right. that was ripping people's arms off. So yes, I think if any of those guys in the house want to learn how to do a hell of an armbar, they will shut up and listen to what Ronda. Not has to mention to say. judo. Ronda Rousey is an Olympic bronze medalist, three-time Pan Am gold medalist, a fourth Dan black belt in right. judo. Did you? You'd hear be so what, stupid uh, not to listen judo, to her when it comes judo to grappling. Um, judo Jean LaBelle. LaBelle. He said that she's the best ever. Why would you go in there with some kind of ego like, oh, she has a vagina, so I can't listen to her? When she might have something to teach you as a badass fighter. Unless she's talking out of her vagina, which even then I would listen to that. That would be interesting. See, I'm, I'm getting beaten up here, man. <laughs> well, when the premise is, I don't she think that vagina. these male fighters are going to listen to these female coaches, even though one of them is an undefeated here? champion. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I want to see would you, would you, if you went, if, Would you ignore their coaching if they were your coaches? It's not that if some of these fighters might be more experienced than the both of them. Might be better fight. You know, just, you know, Why would they be more I'm, I'm curious. It's Why more would fight, they be more, more, more fights under their belt? Kat Zagano is 13 and 4. She's been fighting since, what, like 2000? Right. And Kat Zagano, Misha, Katsugano, Misha Tate, I mean. Since she, she could walk. Yeah, Misha, Misha, Misha Tate's, thir uh, I think, 13 and 4, been fighting for years. But do you think some of these guys may think that that Rousey is just the next the next Gina Caron or no. Lucy's golden girl and that well, Cyborg was legit. Carano was a beast. Well, she wasn't was she was pretty, she is pretty, but, but they were hyped she's a it's fighter. Like it was based around her. You know? Right, but I think Rhonda, whatever you have to say about Rhonda, some people don't like her attitude. Whatever you have to say about Rhonda, Rhonda is awesome for the sport because she is a hell of a fighter. And that's the ball game, folks. Ronda Rousey's a hell of a fighter, and I'll be watching Misha Tate and Ronda Rousey go at it over the Ultimate Fighter next season. Here from Arena Sports Bar in Simi Valley, California, my name's Rich Slayton. Joe Cervelli. Donna Gonzalez. And Gary Chapterman. This is MMA on draft from First Run TV.